to look at a number of scriptures, especially in the book of Colossians. The Apostle Paul begins his prison epistle in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. This Colossian epistle is one of Paul's prison epistles. He wrote four of these from his prison cell, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. These were written from Rome about 62 AD, and Colossae was a small town located near the present day town of Benzaliah. Now you could go there today if you wanted to, I wouldn't recommend it. In the southwestern part of present day Turkey. And that, there is a valley called the Lycus Valley near Mount Cadmus. And at the upper end of the valley was Colossae to whom Paul wrote this epistle. It is uninhabited today. It lies in ruins. Today the ancient site is near a modern town called Kronos. You can locate it on your map. The village of Kronos. About 50,000 people Jewish people lived in Colossae, but mostly they were a Gentile people. There is no record of the establishment of this church. It was not founded by the Apostle Paul. We read that in chapter 1, verse 4 and 9. He only heard of their faith. I'm getting quite an echo out of this. I don't know what the problem is here. Paul is writing to the Colossian church because of false philosophies that had invaded the church. He was concerned that they were being led away from the truth of the gospel by what we believe to be was Gnosticism, which was a denial of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ and a denial of reality. In chapter, he, he was concerned that they were being led astray. And in chapter 2 and verse 1, he writes to the church at I would have you to know what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. We know from that that Paul had not ever been to that church. They had never seen Paul and he had not seen them. But he was good at writing letters. When they put him in jail, he'd just write letters. He never stopped preaching. You know, you can preach uh, vocally or you can preach uh, out loud or you can preach by letters. Paul was a great letter writer. In verse 2, he wants them to understand something about Christ and the Father. We named our church Trinity Baptist Church because we believe in the divine trinity. And in verse 2, he speaks to them that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. Now, the Trinity is a mystery. There are things about it that we do not understand and will not until we get to heaven. 
But still, we need to believe it because it's the Word of God and it's the God we serve. We serve a triune God. He tells them that Christ is the embodiment of all wisdom and knowledge which these false teachers had been claiming. In verse 3, he tells them that Christ is the embodiment of all the wisdom and the knowledge that there is. In verse 3, he says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, he goes on to, in Matthew 13, 54, to give an illustration here in the Scripture. And when he, Jesus, was come into his own country, he taught them in the synagogue, insomuch as they were astonished, and said, Whence hast this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man these, all these things? Jesus astounded the people of his day with the wisdom that he possessed. And they were puzzled. They said, we know him. We know all about him. They thought they did. They, we know his parents, his brothers, his sisters. Where did he learn this? He's never been to a seminary, but uh, he learned and he taught. And they were puzzled. When he was 12 years old, he taught the doctors in the temple further astounding them. And when the soldiers were sent to arrest him, they came back without him. And they asked, where is the prisoner? And he said, never man spake like this man. In other words, if you had heard him speak, you would know why we didn't lay hands on him and bring him back. Nicodemus, said to Jesus, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. In verse 4, Paul issued the first of his warnings to this church. Now this church had evidently been welcoming some of these false teachers into their church. And Paul is warning them, he says in verse 4 and 5, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That word beguile is a Greek word, paralogismea, meaning beguile or to delude or to reckon wrongly. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now Paul is writing to refute six false doctrines. The first one we find here in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the removed rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Mm. Philosophers are people who talk about something they don't understand and make you think it's your fault. <laughs> Somebody has said the more dignified one is philosophy is man's attempt to befuddle himself scientifically. So there are three reasons to beware of philosophy. Number one, it's after the tradition of men. It's nothing but men's theories. Men's hand-me-downs, one from another. In Mark 7 and verse 8, Howbeit in vain 
do they worship me? Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men, such as washing the pots and cups and many other such things like things ye knew. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition, your own paradosis, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. I wonder how many of you have ever heard of Fiddler on the Roof. Have you ever seen that? Uh, not many of you. Oh, you ought to get that and read and listen to it. Fiddler on the Roof. The, this poor Jew in Russia said to the Lord, Lord, I know you love us, but couldn't you love somebody else for a while? Uh, he didn't appreciate his lot there in Russia. But in the time that he was there, and if you listen to that program, you'll enjoy the background of the sufferings of the Jewish people in Russia. Paul says it's after the rudiments of the world. It's, it's what the world believes. It's not after Christ. Mm. Therefore, let no man judge you. Now, if you're a believer in Christ, you are under grace. You're not under law, you're under grace. Amen. And you do not have to let any man judge you as to the things you do or say as long as they're honorable. And Paul says, therefore, in verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or on the new moon or on the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man judge you with the legalism of the Jews. Judaism was built on Moses when he received the Ten Commandments upon Mount Sinai. But we have something better now. We have the commandments of Christ. We're under grace. We've left the Old Testament and we've entered with John the Baptist into a new dispensation, the dispensation of grace. So if we're under the dispensation of grace, then we have freedom there. And we're not to let any man judge us in the peripheral things such as what we eat and what we wear and so on like that. The Sabbath was a shadow. But the rest that God gives is reality. It's in all in Him. We find our rest in Christ. Then he says, let no man beguile you with mysticism of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Today, mysticism is not seen so much, but it would be seen today in the worship of angels, New Age philosophies, horoscopes, palm readings, Ouija boards, astrology. These things are the devil. I remember one time my little daughter had a little daughter across the street, a neighbor, come over to her her house and the neighbor girl had brought a Ouija board and uh, I walked in the, in the house and they had that Ouija board there and that little neighbor girl looked at my 
daughter and said, since your father came in, it won't work. It won't work. She said, it will work at my house, but it won't work here. He said, she said, it's because your father has come in the house. The spirits won't work. Well, that stuff is of the devil. No Christian ought to ever have anything to do with it. And I had to give my daughter a little talk after that. Then he says in verse 20, let no man enslave you with certain dogmatic teachings that are not of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments of the doctrines of men. Now I want to get back to my subject, a place called Calvary. In Luke chapter 23, the cross is set forth as a place. The place is very important. A place called Calvary. From the Latin, the translation is from the Golgotha, which is Aramaic, and it means a cranium, because if you look at a picture of the place where Jesus was crucified, it looks like the place of a skull. Matthew 27, verse 33, when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. We who are believers receive certain benefits because Jesus was in that place. Jesus could not have been crucified anywhere else except in that place to fulfill Scripture. So what do we mean when we speak of the cross? We do not mean that there is salvation in a piece of wood. To speak of the cross as the Bible does so much it means simply what Jesus accomplished on the cross. That's the meaning of the cross. If you hang a cross around your neck, it doesn't mean a thing, except it may be saying that you're a believer in Christ. I think we've got too much volume. Jesus was crucified in the only place where he could have been crucified and that was to fulfill the scripture. Galatians 3.13 tells us that it was the place of a curse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, the Ten Commandments are called the law of God. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's God's law. And the unsaved are under that law. They will be judged by that law. However, we who are Christians have already been judged there's no judgment for us because Christ has taken our judgment for us. Amen. No Christian is under the law, but the unsaved are under the law. We are not. We are under Christ. We are under grace. And so, he says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. When Jesus was crucified on a tree called Calvary, he took 
the curse that we sinners deserve. And he took it in our place. And therefore, since he took it in our place, we will never have to experience that curse of God from sin. The cross is the unique truth of Christianity. The cross is the strength of the preacher. The cross is the secret of all missionary success. The cross is the foundation of all churches' success. The cross is a place of love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved. No one ever loved like God loves. No one ever loved like Jesus loves. It's a love that's beyond comprehension. It's a godly love. It's God's love for poor lost sinners. Then it's a place of substitution for us to be saved and to escape the curse of God on a broken law, we have to have a substitution or we have to die for our own sins. If we don't have a substitution, we are lost and undone. But we have someone who died for us. The Lord Jesus Christ became our substitute. He died in our stead and in our place. And the Bible speaks of us as being dead. For we died with Him when He died. We were buried with Him when He was buried. And we rose with Him when He rose. You say, that's hard to understand. Yes, but much of the Bible is hard to understand without divine illumination. But God will teach those who desire to know place of substitution. Abraham substituted Isaac on Mount Moriah. And as he lifted the knife to plunge it into Isaac, the angel of the Lord caught his arm and said, Ho! There's a ram caught in the thicket. Go get that ram and substitute it instead of Isaac. But in his mind, God had already taken the life of Isaac. He had already, in his mind, assumed that he had given his son to die. So Isaac became the substitute, or the ram became the substitute for Isaac, and Isaac did not have to die. Jesus became our substitute so we don't have to die. We don't have to be judged. We don't have to be sent to the lake of fire because all the judgment of God that we deserve was taken by Jesus on the cross. In Galatians chapter 4, it was a place of redemption. On the cross, Jesus paid the price of our redemption. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. On the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. It was a price that God demanded in justice. And Jesus paid that price of redemption for us. On the cross, Jesus died in our place. He his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. 
On the cross, Jesus offered himself a sacrifice in our stead. He said, No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down on myself. I have power to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. It was a place of reconciliation. On the cross, Jesus opened the door for sinners to come to God through Him. He is the way to God. And only through Him can we come to God. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled. To reconcile means to bring together. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were lost. We were undone. We were ruined. Aliens. Aliens. We hear a lot about aliens today in the border crossing. But we were aliens from God. And we had no passport. We had no way to come to God until we heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then through Him, by hearing the gospel, we came to God. Not as aliens, but as poor lost sinners needing salvation. Then in the sixth place, it was not only a place of reconciliation, but it was a place where blood was shed. Divine blood. Saving blood. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus shed His blood. When I took my first little country church many years ago, there was a lady who came to visit our church. She had just moved into the city and she had moved to this little town where I was. And she came to our church. And I preached on the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And during the week, one of the ladies in our church met this lady in a grocery store and said, oh, I'm so glad you came to visit us last week. Uh, she said, how did you like the service? Oh, she said, I didn't like it and I would never come back to your church again. Oh, she said, what was the matter? She said, because your preacher preached on the blood and it's an offense unto me. Well, that's exactly what the Bible says. <laughs> it's an offense to the unsaved. That's right. They're lost. They hate the blood of Christ. They hate the gospel. They hate the church. They hate the preacher. It's because they're lost. Their eyes have never been opened. They're still blind. It's a place of reconciliation. I like what the hymn writer wrote when they wrote beneath the cross of Jesus. I fain would take my stand the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land from the burning of the noonday heat and the burden of the day a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way. Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonders of His glorious love and my own worthy Ness. Unworthiness. That's what we have to confess. Our unworthiness. Our sinfulness. Our depravity. We are depraved. We came into this world under the depraved nature of Adam. And we lived in that nature until we heard the gospel and were saved by the grace of God. The cross is a place of offense. George Bernard was a little old evangelist and he went and preached in the country church 
or a city church and he listened to the preacher and the preacher preached along these kind of lines. The preacher said, my friends, you ought to repent more or less. And you ought to be converted, as it were, or you will be damned to some extent. That's the kind of preaching that we hear from time to time. Nothing real, nothing, nothing to stir the heart, the conscience. People love to have it so. The cross is a place of vision. George Bernard, I better finish that story. He listened to that preacher who was a liberal, modernistic preacher. And then he went back to his apartment and sat down at the piano and he wrote a hymn. You know what he wrote? With that unbelief still ringing in his ears, he wrote, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the nearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Good answer. <laughs> then the cross is a place of vision. Galatians 3.1 Paul wrote to the Galatians who had departed some of them from the faith. And he said, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently been set forth crucified among you. Now these Galatians had never seen Christ physically. But Paul could say to them, whose eyes Jesus Christ it's evidently set forth crucified among you. It was the gospel that their eyes saw and heard. And you notice something in Galatians 2.20. The apostle Paul said, I am, or I was, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ not only died for us, he also died as us. For when he took our place, he was being the one that we should have been there. He died for us and as us. So you see, we can say this morning, we've already been judged. We've already died. We've already been buried. We've already been risen again. Now that's hard for us to comprehend. But it's our identification with Christ. We are one with Him. When he took our place, that made him and us one. And God the Father looks upon Jesus. And then he looks upon us. And we are one together. For everything that Christ did for us, we did as our Savior did. Your identification with Christ. Has God ever showed you your oneness with the Lord Jesus? That's what we need to understand. He said, I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There were two girls that liked to go to the dances 
And every Saturday night, they would go and meet a group in a clubhouse, and they would dance. But something happened. Something happened. They went to a church meeting and heard the gospel. They were both converted. And after their conversion, they got a letter from the dance instructor. We're going to have the regular Saturday night meeting and we want you to be there. And they sent a letter back and said, I'm sorry, we can't be there. We died last Wednesday night. <laughs> That's right. When he died, we died. Because he died as us. And it's a place of identification, which means Christ's death was our death. It was all reckoned unto us. That's the doctrine of imputation. Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. And we have His righteousness. How righteous do you have to be to go to heaven? You have to be 100% perfectly righteous. Well, that would leave all of us out, wouldn't it? But there is a way that you can be 100% righteous. And that's to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when you do, God has imputed unto you Jesus' righteousness. Read the book of Romans. That's the great book on imputation. The righteousness of God and the righteousness of Christ is ours. Today, this poor sinner stands clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I don't have to turn a tap. I don't have to do a thing. I don't have to hit a lick. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is mine. It was imputed to me without works, by grace. And I now rest in His imputed righteousness. And I'm depending on His imputed righteousness to take me to heaven someday. I'm looking forward to that day. And then... It's a place of glory. I found this poem one day. In the cross of Christ I glory, cowering o'er the wrecks of time. All the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. You know who wrote that? An unbeliever wrote that. An unbeliever. But he understood, even though he wasn't a believer, he understood the truth of it, which he rejected. Galatians 6 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. The Apostle Paul gloried in the cross. There were things that Paul had that he could have gloried in. He said so. He could have gloried in his natural privileges. He could have gloried in his own ministry. He could have gloried in his knowledge of God and Christ. He could have gloried in his spiritual attainments. He could have gloried in his apostleship. But he did not glory in any of those things. What he did glory in is his own testimony. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing we Christians can glory in. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what do we mean by the cross? 
Do we mean that there is some saving efficacy in that piece of wood on which Jesus died? No. There was no saving efficacy in that piece of wood. The saving efficacy is in what Jesus accomplished on that piece of wood. That's the meaning of the cross. You can hang a cross around your neck. It won't do anything for you. You have to accept what happened on that cross. What transpired? What took place? What did God in heaven do when He let His Son die on Calvary's cross? He did so much. We can't imagine it all. He brought us into the family of God. He gave us a new life. He gave us a new heart. He made us a new person. All that took place on the cross of Calvary. I am the good shepherd and I gave my life for the sheep. I read a story about a man named Steinberg. Steinberg was one of the most famous of artists. He painted beautiful pictures. And one day, he saw a little gypsy girl, and he was taken by her beauty. And he invited her to come and to sit for some paintings. And she would come each day and sit there while he painted. And he painted a masterpiece, they say. I don't hold the paintings of Christ, but nevertheless, he painted what they call a masterpiece, Christ on the cross. And the little girl said to Peter, this man on the cross must have been a very wicked man to be nailed to the cross like that. And he said, oh no. No, the painter said on the contrary, he was a very good man. The best man that ever lived. He died for others. And the little girl looked at him and said, Did he die for you? And Steinberg was not a Christian at the time. And he couldn't get away from that question of that little gypsy girl. Did he die for you? And I would ask you this morning, did he die for you? If he died for you, then all the blessings of this Bible are yours. They're all yours. And someday God will take you into heaven and he'll display you before the worlds. This is my child. I redeem this one. For my own glory. Did he die for you? If he did, you're saved. If he didn't, you're not saved. So I ask you the question Did he die for you? I know this morning he died for me. And I believe that he died for most of you. But if there's anybody here this morning that's not sure, you need to put your faith in Christ and all the things He did for you on the cross. And then you can say, yes, He died for me. Let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer, please.